I was thrust into an environment. The people I met were actually, for the most part, really lovely. But I think I also had no clue what I was getting into. Um, I don't think you possibly really can at that age. Yeah. My thing was, I thought the vice president was great. We had a lovely chat. I, I, if anyone had sat in on our interview, you would have understood instantly why we clicked over the things that we were discussing in, in the book. And my goal, my theory was, well, I'm, I'm, I'm writing speeches for him. He's great. Um, this is gonna be fun. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a lot at a very young age. I still feel super young and <laughs> like, I think questions about my competence, mm. um, being the youngest or one of the youngest people in lots of these spaces, I think always come like crop up in the back of my mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they definitely did there. I think they still do even today. Ore Agumbi is an author, journalist, and co-host of the award-winning podcast, The Intelligence by The Economist. Despite a parent have laughing it out, Ore speaks about her difficulties on her journey of pushing life to new levels of excellence. What really stood out to me was how she highlights the importance of never settling when it comes to your potential by embracing new challenges and going beyond what feels comfortable to you. I'm Claude Williams, the founder of Dream Nation, and this is the Behind the Dreams podcast. Hey. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you for coming to my podcast today. No worries, I'm happy to be here. Obviously, uh, we had a conversation not too long ago, and from that, the thing that really stood out to me about you is you've had such a unique pathway to success. And that's what I'd love to explore for today's episodes. Cool. Thanks. Cool. I'm, I'm kind of flattered, really, but yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping we're going to be able to touch on some of the amazing things that you've done, because in all honesty, when we were uh, like actually looking, up, looking you up and looking at your bio, it's like, how have you been able to accomplish all this already? It's just outstanding. Thank you. But with that, you you kind of had this um, ability to change your goals and your dreams quite often. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think um, when I talk about being an author, so uh, Taking Up Space came out in 2019. Whenever I talk about the book and kind of the process of writing, I always tell people that I never thought I was going to be a writer. It just was not one of the things that was on the checklist. It wasn't really um, even one of my ambitions. But I think it's a real like testament to how much like my dreams have changed since even when I was in secondary school. And I think I began to get a sense of like what I wanted to do. When I was in school, I thought I wanted to go into law. I'd watched a bit of Suits. Um, and I just kind of liked the idea of like being really argumentative in front of a judge. Mm. Um, kind of sort of quickly realized that most of law, especially like where there seems to be a decent amount of money, doesn't actually really look like that. Um, but also I I uh, was I went to do a summer school right. um, and I tried to get into the law kind of class of the summer school. And it was full for some reason. So I was like, okay, second best option, I'll do international relations. And I absolutely fell in love. Um, so much so that by the time I was done with the summer school, I was like, I'm gonna apply to university to do something to do with international relations and politics. Um, I learned a lot about neocolonialism and it really, really, it really made me angry. But it also, I feel like that was my, that was my like, moment of awakening. That was yeah. my, I suddenly became woke. I was learning all this stuff about France Fanon and about yeah. like what the world had done to black Africa. And I was just very, very on fire, but also clearly wanted to learn a lot more about this. So now I was yeah. like, okay, I'm abandoning law. So before you go on, go on. for those that don't know, what is neocolonialism? Okay, so pretty much the idea that independence was only really in name alone. So p countries that were colon colonized and then were granted their independence by their colonizers are actually still very much ruled by the ideas that were established in colonial times um, and like entrenched in those times. So psychologically, Franz Fanon writes a lot about the psychological impact of colonialism um, and how actually real freedom requires something much more cathartic, um, including violence uh, for like, uh, black people to actually be free from the ideas that have colonized us. Um, and he writes a lot about the, yeah, the psychological colonialism, which I, I just thought was really interesting. Yeah. I learned a lot about the world in basically a span of two weeks. Mm. And it, I, I had to change my whole plan. Um, at 16, I had quite a clear plan for my life. I was gonna study law. I was gonna qualify in, in the UK as a lawyer. Then I was gonna move back to Nigeria, qualify there and basically work in law, become a Nigerian senator at about 45 and then decide if I wanted to do anything more. So my life was planned out from 16 to 45, yeah. but it all started with me doing law. I had to kind of throw that out the window. So 
not many 16 year olds have <laughs> such a, a literally what 30 year plan 40 year Pretty plan much, for their lives yeah how did that happen um I think I was quite inspired by my dad. My dad has just lived a very cool life. Um, interestingly, his life also, he switched plans and, and routes quite a few times. But as a kid, I always used to ask him why he wouldn't go into politics in Nigeria and get really frustrated when I just, I just wasn't really satisfied with his answers. Oh, politics is a dirty game. Oh, you know. So I kind of saw it as like, well, he didn't do it. I need to take up this mantle. Mm -hmm. And my logic was, Law will get me this kind of nice career that sets me up nicely to, and I, I knew the difference between being a senator and like being in like the executive enough to know that I wanted to be in a senator to actually change laws um, and not necessarily to be president. So in my head, I was like, I'm gonna do lots of law. I'm gonna become what's called a senior advocate of Nigeria, kind of like the Nigerian equivalent to being a member of the Queen's Council. Um, and then I was gonna do this thing. But yeah, law went out the window. I then told myself I would do a law conversion at uni yeah. Law went out the window again because I decided actually I didn't want to do that at all. Um, I didn't get into any training contracts that would have let me do a law conversion basically for free. Yeah. Um, I didn't even get interviews for them. I was really upset. But I kind of embraced the pivot. Um, I was like, okay, well, if I'm, I'm not getting this, I'm going to do something else. And mm. then I wrote this article called A Letter to My Fresher Self, which really was like just a well-crafted rant. Like I was really angry. I'd been at Cambridge for... I think two-ish years at this point, um, and just felt like I kept not getting things that I felt like I deserved or had worked for. I missed out on the student election, which really upset me because I felt like I lost to someone who had not proven themselves. Yeah. Um, I hadn't gotten all these jobs, and I was just feeling very kind of lost and very aware of like what role race and my gender might have possibly played into that. And I wrote this letter to my fresher self um, and the article just goes crazy. Um, and then I'm like, okay, well, maybe I wanna write. Maybe I want to write more like features. So the goal was never actually really to write news. The goal was always, maybe I want to write features. Mm -hmm. um, and I looked into going to Columbia Journalism School for a master's more to figure out whether or not I wanted to do journalism. Right. And because I basically spoke to my dad and it was a very emotional conversation because he was very upset with me for telling him that I was going to do law and then not gonna do it for undergrad. Okay, I'll do a conversion. Now it's time for me to do the conversion. I don't wanna do that anymore. Um, but where, where was that sense of being upset coming from in terms of you changing your, your goals? I think he, Again, I think he kind of felt like he could have been a great lawyer. I don't think he admit, he I don't think he will admit to that, but I think mm. deep down he sees law as like this very prestigious thing. A lot of Nigerian parents do, by the way. It's law, engineering, doctor. Like there's no there's not much um I, I don't think people value careers outside of those nearly as much. Yeah. Um and so it was my dad sees me as quite clever, he always, you know, kind of goes on about how proud he is of me. And I think for him, the pinnacle of that pride would have been to go and do something law related. So he was very upset, um, but I was putting my foot down and I wasn't doing it. Mm. I just and decided I, it was how, not gonna happen. How was that in terms of, cause I'm sure you knew that this was gonna be a difficult thing for him. What was that like for you to, I guess, go against your, your parents' wills for you? Yeah, it was tough. So it wasn't my parents. My mum, mm. uh, I think my mum had gotten a sense a little earlier that right. I might be backing out of the law thing. Um, we just kind of didn't really address it until I really had to, because yeah. he just kept asking like how it was going. Uh, I got my uncle involved, my dad's brother, and I spoke to him first because um, he also had a kid who had made a career pivot. And my dad had been really kind of pivotal in speaking to him about her case. Mm. So I kind of hoped that my uncle would do the same for me. And he did, um, he really did actually help. Um, and yeah, that's, he's been my uncle who's kind of shown up at like all the graduations. Like he was, he was very much on side. So I knew he would also speak up for me. I needed to make sure my mom was on side. And I also needed to make sure that my plan, my plan B was also pretty clear. Yeah. Um, in many ways, I actually wish I had delayed the conversation until my plan B was a bit clearer, but he helped me with the plan B. So it also ended up being fine. He was the one who suggested, well, if you do want to do this journalism thing, you have to go to Colombia. Like that's literally where they decide the Pulitzers. Like mm -hmm. there's nowhere else. So you get into Colombia and then like, and luckily I did um, and it was fine, but it was, um, 
yeah, it was tearful. Uh, I cried because he was just so angry. <laughs> yeah. um, and even after I got my degree from Columbia, he was like, you know, there's this anchor on CNN and she has a law degree. <laughs> I'm like, drop <laughs> it, man. <laughs> drop it, it's not happening. Um, but yeah, I think all those kind of little pivots. And then finishing Columbia and getting a job in government, um, not in governance, but I was working for uh, the federal government of Nigeria. And even that itself was a pivot because... Yeah. And I how, how said I was going to journalism. How, yeah, how did you end up in the Nigerian government? Yeah, it was the book. It was the book. Uh, <laughs> taking up space, did 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 a couple numbers. Um, and that also was kind of not really in the plan either. I didn't know we, were, we would be getting a book deal after university, um, which meant that while I was at Columbia, I was also writing this book, which was amazing and very fulfilling. Um, I'd been mentoring quite a bit when I was in uni and really enjoyed that and doing things with like trying to get more black kids into Cambridge. So it was just writing it and then being able to write it with my best friend who I had done so much of this stuff with while I was at uni was just very, very fulfilling. Um, and yeah, the book made it into the hands of the vice president of Nigeria, which was funny because I, I went for the interview and thought, oh, I have to show him my book. Like maybe it's gonna help me like get this job. And I walk into the interview and he has a copy of the book in his hand already. Mm. And I'm like, oh, gee, it's okay. He's actually like, and he, we're like talking about the book, like he's clearly actually read it. Um, so that's interesting because one thing that I've always been told is that nowadays books are the best possible business card that you can have. But with your story, I'm hearing, firstly, you had a plan as, as a 16 year old. Yeah. Um, you went to Cambridge University, which you just glazed over the fact that that happened yeah, as well. Just... But <laughs> went to Cambridge University, um, you managed to secure a book deal um, after doing some important advocacy work at your university, raising awareness for this issue. And then you found yourself at the um, government in Nigeria. That's a lot for what, what I'm guessing was around 22, 23 or so. Yeah, I started, uh... Yeah, I moved back to Abuja when I was 22. Um, and that was a big deal at the time because I was very aware that I was the youngest person in literally the whole government. Um, I think someone actually points out to me later that I was the youngest, I think the youngest political appointee ever at that age. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was hard. I was thrust into an environment. The people I met were actually for the most part, really lovely. The people I worked alongside every day um, were really nice. I feel like really took me under their wing. But I think I also had no clue what I was getting into. Um, I don't think you possibly really can at that age. Yeah. My thing was, I thought the vice president was great. We had a lovely chat. I, I, if anyone had sat in on our interview, you would have understood instantly why we clicked um, over the things that we were discussing in, in the book. And my goal, my, theory was well I'm, I'm i'm writing speeches for him he's great um this is gonna be fun yeah um but yeah it was it was a lot at a very young age uh yeah i still feel super young and like <laughs> not even uh i still wonder how um it's not like the general imposter syndrome stuff but i think questions about my competence mm. um being the youngest or one of the youngest people in lots of these spaces, I think always come like crop up in the back of my mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they definitely did there. I think they still do even today. What um, I find really interesting about your story is that it's very much so the pathway of what I try to teach people about being a practical dreamer. You had a belief, you had something that you was important to you and then you took action consistently. Um, and I feel like going back to the original, I guess, theme around changing your, changing your goals, changing your dreams, Sometimes we don't know what our pathways are going to be in the end, uh, but yet like by taking action, by being open, by being, being reflective, being, um, uh, like being flexible with things available to you, it meant that you've ended up in this amazing position. But kind of as you were just saying, yes, it's a little bit above where your age would typically be. And then you have to deal with these feelings of imposter syndrome. How did you do that? Ooh, um, I think leaning on, past successes has definitely helped. Um, I have to remind myself that if I've been, if I was able to do that before, then I can do this. Mm. Uh, that thing felt super hard to me then. And now I, you know, I overcame that. I think that definitely has helped. 
Um, I think also just trying to focus on the value that I add um, in these different environments has been quite important. Sometimes my youthful exuberance can be an asset in places that are like very old and stodgy. So I try and focus on that, for example. Um, what can my energy bring that no one else can? And instead of basically using how I'm different or how I'm, yeah, let's stick with different, how I'm different, instead of viewing that as something that uh, puts me a step behind anyone or, or uh, makes me any less worthy of being in a space, seeing it as it's something that can add value to this space. So when I, uh, I guess Cambridge, we could have probably have said that for anyone who's working within our society at the time. Our value add was we're going to be the people who open the doors for all the, a whole bunch of other black people who are going to come. And the number of black people in Cambridge now is to the point that like the, an African Caribbean society is almost redundant because there are so many sub societies of like different black students, um, which I guess is kind of the goal, right? Mm -hmm. That's how much of a value add like we were all able to be there when it comes to even the book like there's nothing that's been written like this before do you think people will read it well no actually because there's nothing that's been written like this before is exactly why people clearly need to read yeah. this in, in government yes i'm this young person who i speak too much english i i'm also very obviously an activist at heart which i guess kind of also became a challenge as i went on but how can i use that to my uh, benefit and like to add value. Okay, when I'm writing speeches, especially speeches where like the vice president will have to go and speak to young people, where, where are the things that I can add to show that like he's actually in tune with like the pulse of younger people? Yeah. Um, where can I just add like a bit of flair that I, only I could possibly add? And I think yeah. about that even in my job today. Like I'm at The Economist now and it's just, um, The Economist is obviously a very old institution, but constantly thinking like, how can I make sure that when we're covering this thing, like we cover a little bit better or we are even covering this thing at all. Um, and, and that, you know, we're able to speak on things that maybe we wouldn't otherwise because like you have people like me now who can like offer a bit of guidance on that. Yeah. So yeah, the imposter syndrome is still there. I just try and flip it. So even with all of that said, I'm picking up like this undercurrent of so much confidence in yourself, which is like really beautiful to hear. I know there's the imposter syndrome, but there's also the other side of it of this, like almost it feels unshakable confidence. How do you go about developing that? Uh, I am really flattered to hear you say that. I think, um, I don't think confidence or even building it is, is a very straightforward thing. Uh, I think I have been blessed with lots of really great support systems. Like I said earlier, like I never doubted, like my parents have always been super proud of me. Um, even from my friends, my family, I've constantly had like positive reinforcement around me. Um, I moved to Nigeria when I was seven. I think that was a very key part of my confidence from like a racial perspective um, in that I didn't have to deal with those feelings of being othered constantly um, and of being a minority or people uh, having certain kinds of prejudices, obviously that come with being like the only black person in the space. I didn't have those for very formative years of my life because I was living in Nigeria. I think that was very important. Um, but I think, yeah, I've just had, I've been blessed with very, very good support systems. I also think, um, like when I say confidence is not straightforward, I'm good at talking about this kind of stuff. I'm good at dealing with the professional kind of uh, things that lean towards like the academic. Like I, I know how to perform confidence in those kinds of spaces. I know yeah. how to do things like this. Like I'm good at speaking. That's because yeah. I used to debate loads as a kid. Like I'm, I'm good at the presentational stuff. I think in terms of like social and personal stuff, there were definitely uh, years where like academically and like professionally things looked good but like socially and personally my confidence was very much like on the floor and there were lots of internal insecurities that I think I battled with that you just didn't have to see because I was good at keeping up a good face yeah. um, and so I say that because I think it's very easy to like do things like this do lots of public speaking and, and, and or podcasts even in, in writing and, and these kinds of spaces and come across as confident because I'm well practiced in this stuff now but the more personal things, like that doesn't mean I'm not battling other kinds of insecurities and other lapses in confidence, which actually are just as important. Yeah. Um, and, and, and 
I think often people ignore in these kinds of discussions. So in, in taking up space, we get an opportunity to be quite vulnerable about the mm. fact that I really struggled in my first year, for example. But you wouldn't have been able to tell because I was very good at like outwardly kind of saving face, being really social and like out there seemingly. Um, yeah. But like actually on a, on a more like kind of subliminal mental level, I was really struggling and mm. just didn't have the words to even articulate that to people who are closest to me. Do you still feel like you have to perform confidence? Yeah, uh, my job, I literally host a <laughs> podcast, I yeah. think, yes. Um, but I think some of it is also like faking it till you make it. Like mm. I, I, I definitely think I've become more confident fully in the past uh, like couple of years. Yeah. Um, Really randomly, I, I saw some pictures of myself from a wedding uh, that was a few weeks ago. And I was dancing so much. Mm. And like, it's such a minor thing. But for the longest time, I used to be so conscious of how I look when I dance. Mm. Um, to the point that like, it, it was definitely a detriment to like how much I enjoyed myself. But I've just realized that I've become more, not even confident in that I'm a good dancer, but just less less worried and less insecure about some of those things I think really used to bother me before. In the same way that I said that, you know, Nigeria was great for my confidence, like as a kid um, and thinking about, you know, like not having a chip on my shoulder and, and not having these like feelings of othering that I think can be really bad for your confidence. Nigeria also has kind of social pressures of its own yeah. that are very much uh, social centered that I think I did struggle with on the other hand. So great mm -hmm. for my confidence in some ways, terrible in others. And I think I'm noticing the ways in which the, in the past few years that I've kind of been able to actually come out of my shell. Yeah. Um, so, like in private. Yeah. And firstly, I really relate with the whole dancing thing. Like <laughs> any, anyone that knows me knows that that is one of my biggest struggles. Um, God willing, next year that will be resolved as well. <laughs> I uh, believe it for you. <laughs> thank you. It's important. Um, but with that said, I know what I'm doing to, I guess, build up confidence in different areas of my life. And you spoke about the environment that you had, like friends, family, et cetera, that supported you, but you've also sp spoken to me before around things that you've done that actually helped you build up your confidence in yourself. Like the way you think about things, yeah. things of that nature. Could you um, tell us a bit about that? So, okay, for example, and I've realized just, I, I don't think this is as, as normal a thing as maybe I thought it was. I speak to myself a lot. And I think how you speak to yourself and how you, um, Just the ways in which you affirm yourself, I think are quite important. When I was prepping for my Cambridge interview, and I give this advice to people who are pre prepping for interviews all the time, there's only so much time you can do mock interviews or prepare with people who actually understand the content that you're talking about. A lot of the time I was explaining concepts to myself to make sure I could explain it if I was in a situation like my interview when I would have to. And I would stand in front of the mirror and I would just literally speak to myself about this topic. And it sounds kind of crazy, but it's, it's the very kind of practical stuff that you can do in private that will help you when you're trying to speak in public, for example. Mm. When I was um, 11, when I was in primary school, I was head girl. This was a, a huge deal for me. Um, and head girls have to give this valedictory speech at my, this at my primary school in, in Nigeria. And I'd written this speech weeks before and I practiced it. And every day I would come home from school and with my mom and dad in the living room, I'd have to practice this speech. Um, I think this is where some of those habits were like built. So I would mm. practice this speech. I would get really, really good at it. Small feedback here and there of, you know, no, no, you have to make sure when you come on this part, this part, okay, I'm ready. I'll do it again, do it again. Lots of practice. Mm. On the day, I gave the speech really well, but I also burst into tears toward the end because I was so sad to be leaving the school. Mm. Um, it was super emotional. It was amazing. I literally still have parents to this day who see me and remember this speech where wow. I cried. I was 11 years old. <laughs> um, but those kinds of, you know, just... The, that practicing of like getting used to doing things in private to prepare for things that you're going to do in public. Um, even when I used to write speeches for the vice president, I wasn't the one giving the speeches, but I would always make sure like stand up when you give them, for example. Now, before I go into podcasts, similarly, I'm going through all like my points and things in my brief before I go into the actual recording. I think, and just reminding yourself that like you're that girl, you know, yeah. I think that's quite important before you go into all the public spaces and, and have to do all that. With my debates, similarly, I was always like at home going through those arguments in my head, tease them out with people who are close to you. But oftentimes don't rely on anyone else, just get in front of a mirror and do it yourself. I think you said such an important lesson right there and it's around 
what we do in private will eventually show up in public. So a lot of time people have this negative thoughts that they're saying, oh, I can't do this or I'm not good at that or I'm X, Y, and Z. And sooner or later it will show up in their performance. Yeah. Whereas it seems like you're very deliberate around, you know what, even when no one else is around, like I'm not going to get any like accolades or praise or whatever. I'm still going to be super intentional about what I do and how I speak to myself. 100%. And it's, it's similarly when you're doing that, you even become aware of like what your flaws are, for example. Um, small things like I'm trying to say like a lot less because like I said, I'm, I'm having to do things like be on a podcast where I'm, I have to speak clearly. Um, and it's also just annoying for editors. You have to crop this stuff out all the time. That's something that I've become aware of, but also have been able to curb because I practice in private on my own. Um, so yeah, it, it also makes you aware of your flaws. Um, mm. I, I think it's partly also why I speak so loudly because I'm so used to speaking where people don't have to listen. Like I'm just in my house <laughs> speaking to myself all the time, mm. um, which also is not always the vibe. Um, sometimes I actually need to speak a bit more softly, but uh, <laughs> it's just, yeah, it helps you pick up on things that you're great at and get better at, at those things and hone those skills. But similarly, like it makes you aware of like where you do actually need more practice yeah. um, and where you do actually just need to keep going and things aren't maybe ready for the world yet. Similarly with writing, it's like, drafting and redrafting uh it's kind of the same approach but like doing it speaking to yourself i feel like yeah. i have found a lot more effective for you, for you no that makes sense and it reminds me of a, a lesson my coach used to always say which is um practice makes permanent not perfect so whether we practice the good or the bad yeah. that is what's going to stick uh but on a super practical level now in terms of if people want to like work on how they talk to themselves and rehearse things can you do that through do you do that through writing or is it always spoken or are there other ways that people mm. can try that out it's a mix it's a mix I, I do go through phases of journaling um but even when I journal even when I write and this comes to uh writing the book but also just writing like articles uh for work I, I feel like I write how I speak and I think it's just my preferred kind of medium is like I said like the whole like kind of talking to myself and and uh, uh, going through things verbally helps me then in my writing because I try and write in a way that I think I, I can communicate clearly. So my writing, I think, comes across as quite conversational because it's how I'm thinking through things in my head. I always, yeah, I feel like I'm constantly talking to myself. I think practically it's one of the best things that you can do, not just in terms of being a public speaker because it then in turn will help you write more clearly. Um, because you're conscious of how things actually sound and are being communicated to someone else because you're hearing them. Um, I think that's quite important. Okay. So you've got your book, you've yeah. got your degree, you've got a great job of The Economist. You've been already like worked with the vice president of Nigeria. You've done all these amazing things already. Do you feel like you've reached your peak? I don't like to think about one single peak. Um, I think at each of those points and even probably a few points in between, I felt like I've hit some kind of new peak. Um, and I find that personally to be a more helpful way to think about the next steps. Because if not, you just end up on some big low chasing uh, a past moment. Like when I got into Cambridge, that was huge. For me, for my family, for, uh, even the people who didn't believe in me, um, that was a huge moment. But if I had seen that as my peak, and I think there are definitely people who do, like you're like 50, 60 years old and still talking about when you got into Cambridge, I'm just a bit like, come on now. Mm. Like surely you've had other <laughs> things that you're more proud of. Um, but if I had stopped there, I don't think I would have been nearly uh, as proud or as grateful for the other opportunities that came as well. Taking up space obviously was a huge, uh, a huge peak, like getting a book published at 22 was huge. Um, but again, couldn't have ended there. Like, I, I, I think I see them as many peaks. I think it's more helpful to see it that way just because if not, you're constantly chasing something that's already gone. And I think even now, yeah, being at The Economist, amazing. There are people who hear my voice every day, amazing. Mm. But at the same time, like, I'm like, this, this can't be the peak. Yeah. This can't be the peak. There's got to be, there's got to be more. Um, and I think, I think that's a more, a, a healthier way um, for thinking about achievements. Because if not, 
you you reach something and you will feel it's not about feeling uh, 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 unsatisfied or like unfulfilled I've taken in each of those moments I think I've really given myself like room to rest a little bit to actually sit in it and enjoy it which is important um but part of that flexibility part of part of that changing of your plan that like we were speaking about earlier comes with realizing that this is not you, you can't say oh your whole life is built up to this moment what about the next moment yeah um i think you should always hope that there's going to be even better ones around the corner and yeah not just hope for them but work towards them yeah has it always been a linear journey for you? So has you, have you gone from one peak to the next and just keep going up or has your path been different? Tough one. Um, I don't think it's been linear. Um, I think if anything, that's also why changing the plan feels so useful because it feels like I'm on a completely new path every single time and I don't have to think too much about how it compares or how it progresses or doesn't from the kind of bit that I was on before. Mm. Um, my 30 year plan for myself that I had when I was 16 was definitely very linear. And I think because, I mean, that plan kind of had to go in the bin quite early on. I've just kind of done away with those, um, not done away with them completely, but I, I've, I've, I try not to be bound by thinking about things in terms of more like, linear even progressive steps mm. um and instead trying to appreciate all the kind of little steps for what they have been so i think i think that's tough because when people ask you what's next most times they're thinking about what's next in terms of where you currently are like yeah. in this kind of more linear journey mm. um when we wrote the book everyone's asking where's book two who says we want to write book two for taking up space who says we even want to write another book at all? Who says we're even going to write another book together? But th there's this assumption, you write one book and it's because you're, you're going to write five or 10 in your life or career. Um, again, probably also an assumption that when I started working in government, I was a special assistant, I would go on to be a senior special assistant and then hopefully a this and a, a, special, a special advisor and then it all didn't happen. Um, yeah. And I'm fine with that. Um, and even now being at The Economist, and I, I think... I'm sure people, and people do ask me all the time, like, what's next? I don't know. I actually have no idea. Um, and that's kind of because I've had to kind of free myself from these long, linear, kind of progressive looking plans for my life and realizing that I, actually I can do many things mm. um, and trying to be free and like freed by that thought that I can do many things and they don't have to be sequential. They don't have to be progressive. It doesn't have to come one after the other or one one thing doesn't have to necessarily be better than the thing I did before. It's just different. It's yeah. It's just different. That's such a, once again, really helpful idea because I've been there myself. Entrepreneurship, board roles, whatever it might be, where, okay, it looks like this is the, nat the next natural progression within mm -hmm. that. And sometimes you can fall into a trap for yourself or even worse when you let other people trap you there. Exactly. So allowing yourself to have that freedom of, whatever it is, it's, it's going to be different and it will be what it is when you get there. Yeah, literally. So throughout your journey, you've spoken around like you've worked with the uh, vice president, you worked with your co-author to write this book and you worked with groups of people to bring these projects to life at Cambridge and other places. And it feels like collaboration is a really important idea and theme in your life. Like, would you say that's always been the case? So actually, yes. And I, I think I've been surprised by how much like partnership working with other people collaboration um has been such a key part of my journey because I even just kind of like growing up um I always hated like group projects and I think part of why I, I hated things like group projects was because not in an arrogant way but I always just felt like if I was just given space to get on with this on my own like I would be able to do this like perfectly fine um that's kind of a harmful idea because you kind of close yourself off to the fact that there are actually people out there who are also better than you um, at the things, things that you're, you're doing. And I also just think because that it's so clear to me now that at every, at every peak uh, kind of that I mentioned, at every single point, it's never been just about me. So when it was in terms of getting into Cambridge, for example, um, I had a very, very good um, mentor. I don't even think he would have called myself my mentor because he was kind of just assigned to me, but he was the person who was doing the mock interviews with me. The way it kind of worked at, at my school, you, 
if you were a scholar, you were kind of, you went into this like Oxbridge club, but you could also go if you weren't a scholar, but no one was really putting money on anyone who wasn't a scholar. But this was the guy who was my mentor. And he, when everyone else was just having a couple mock interviews, he was having more with me. I think to the point that in my last mock interview, he literally made me cry, like kind of sad, but like at the same time I cried so that I wouldn't cry in the real interview. Mm. And if I didn't have people like him behind me, there's no way I would have been pushed to the point um, of actually being able to be comfortable in my interview and, like, and making it. When I was in, um, in Cambridge, had I not met Chelsea, one, because just obviously us writing, taking up space together, but before that, even working together as, uh, as the, in the um, African Caribbean society, there's no one else that I, I, I mean, at the time anyway, there's genuinely no one else I feel like I could have that was matching like the work ethic and like the passion that I had for the, these things that I wanted to do. But you meet someone who is not only giving you that, but giving you way more than even you feel like you're putting into it. Um, and it makes working with other people, not just easier, but also really, really additive to your life. So yes, she was my best friend. She was my support system because she's my best friend, but also she was my accountability partner. She was like, my kind of co-pilot when it came to everything concerning society and eventually my co-author like the thought of writing another book on my own without Chelsea is just difficult because I don't have like that person yeah. similarly when I went to um, work in government it's because someone put my name forward and suggested someone got my book to him mm. um, I, I even like my job at The Economist again people putting your names in rooms where you're not in them um, and so collaboration even doesn't I, I don't think it necessarily has to look like oh working in a big fancy team I think it's also just been working with people appreciating people um, also opening yourself up to people as well um, telling people when you have like specific challenges as well so they know where they can kind of uh, meet your weaknesses exactly yeah. exactly uh, meet your weaknesses which I, I feel like yeah Chelsea was there's many ways in which Chelsea has has done that for me um, but I just feel like none of none of the things I've done or accomplished, I've done on my own. Yeah. And I think that realization is very important because if not, you you kind of, um, you end up thinking that you can do all these things on your own. And also you end up feeling super weighed down when things maybe aren't necessarily moving for you or you think that you're in a, just generally quite a stagnant point. It's not just, just only you, like actually reach out to the people who are around you. Mm. Um, and really lean on those support systems. I mentioned support systems earlier as well, because again, all this confidence that I feel like I have now like learned to have when it comes to public speaking and also just generally doing things in more public spaces has come from the fact that I have had people behind me the whole way. So yeah, it's, it's just surprising to me because I think I considered myself a super independent, I don't need anyone, I can do everything on my own kind of person. But at each, at each point, I've become so much more aware of just how much I really have relied and depended on the people around me yeah. for whatever success it is that I'm celebrating in that moment. So yeah, That's a, you need people. Such a beautiful mentality, or as they often say, team what makes the dream work. Yes. <laughs> well, Ove, you have been an absolutely amazing guest. Uh, you. you are a powerhouse. You're doing amazing things in the world around us. And I know your future peaks are going to be even more impressive. And I'm Thank looking you. forward to seeing it. Um, I asked my guests all one final question before we Go leave, on. which is simply, who else do you think should be on our podcast in the future? I really think you should speak to Chelsea and to Jeanette. I've mentioned Chelsea many times in this conversation. Chelsea has a sister called Jeanette. She also has a brother called Louis. I don't know how many people you can possibly fit <laughs> on this couch, to be honest. Um, if you think I'm a powerhouse, I genuinely think you need to meet them. Um, you, I, I've known Chelsea now since I was 18, and I am consistently, again and again, just in awe of the things that she's able to do. Um, the things that she has done. And I also mentioned Jeanette. Jeanette is also just happens to be my agent because she's basically my big sister too. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of also just understanding that it's okay to have many dreams, be good at many things, use your confidence in many ways. Um, and a reminder that my kind of pathway to success isn't necessarily linear, isn't necessarily what everyone else expects of me. Um, and there's pos you, you can possibly be good at many, many things. Um, I feel like they've all taught me a lot 
But I think, yeah, you need to get Chelsea on this couch and then you also need to get Jeanette and Louis on this couch. Trust me, when you have them all here, you'll understand why I say that they're powerhouses. Sounds good. Now, I'll, I'll definitely talk to Abby Sawyer and see if we can make that happen. You should. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing where your journey takes you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. We release a new episodes every Sunday, so make sure that you subscribe and follow us so that you never miss out. If you'd like some more inspiration while you wait for the next new episode, then check out the recommendation above. Don't forget to follow us on social media and you can send us a question or a dilemma that you'd like us to answer on the podcast. This is Claude Williams, you've been watching Behind the Dreams and we look forward to seeing you at the next Dream Nation event.